Hey, welcome to Five Church. You have found us in our Tongues of Fire series. This series is all about the mystery of the faith now revealed and this invisible kingdom that we're a part of. I know you're going to be blessed by this content each and every week. Enjoy. So while you stay standing, would you open your Bibles with me? Let's read from the Word of God. Open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. And uh, I'm going to dive right in and I'm going to start at verse 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. It reads, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the report about Him went out through all the surrounding country. And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. And as was His custom, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to Him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And He rolled up the scroll and He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on Him. And He began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. We've covered several topics around the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Today, I thought we could close out our theories by understanding anointing. Understanding anointing. You're ready for the Word of God? All right, before you take your seat, find someone's forehead, lay your hands on them and say, anointed in Jesus' name. Do it real quick. Do it real quick. Just anoint them in the name of Jesus. Some of you are like, I will not participate in that. <laughs> so I was telling a story to some people last week about my childhood and the church setting that I, that I grew up in. I'm always fascinated to know how many people actually grew up in church. You know, that you didn't come to Christ in your later years, in your teenage years, but as a child, you grew up in church. Just just for interest's sake, how many people grew up in the church? Okay, more in the 11.30 than the 9.30. Okay, we're casual Christians in the 11.30. We're used to, I'm joking, I'm joking. But I know what it's like to grow up in the church, uh, and I've got some unique perspectives, because I didn't just grow up in the church, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. That's a whole other set of stories that you have. Because the, there's unique experiences for those that grew up in the Pentecostal church. The church that I grew up uh, was, was uh, called Crossroads Christian Fellowship. A strategically named church simply because it was located at a place called the Crossroads. It was a major intersection in the city. We had the Crossroads car dealership. We had the Crossroads uh, bakery. We had, even had the Crossroads Chinese store. It was amazing. Best food after church. And... Crossroads Christian Fellowship also had a Christian school attached to it. It was called Newcastle Christian Life Academy. This wasn't even a school. This was an academy. It was a military unit for soldiers of Jesus Christ. This was what the academy was. <laughs> we, we, we weren't real competitive in the sport arena, but my goodness, if there was ever a memory verse competition, we would have dominated. <laughs> Give us a theological debate and we would have smoked you. I know what it's like here in, 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 in the U.S. It's, it's common, I know this, to pledge allegiance to the flag at the beginning of the school day. We would recite the books of the Bible in order. That was what we did. It was an academy. So I pretty much, growing up, spent six days minimum out of the week at church. And often Saturday as well. We'd have a fair or a feast or some kind of potluck that someone decided to put on just so that we can be at church again. So spent all of my years, so you could figure how much as a child, I knew the church like the back of my hand. I knew every nook, cranny, and passageway. I knew how to hide it. I spent one whole sermon one Sunday under the stage. <laughs> Just because. I knew, how to, I, I knew how to evade my parents. I knew how to get around the place. I was a church kid. In fact, one time I was hiding out. Now, now I've got to tell you this. We, we would often have some fascinating stuff in church, some weird stuff and some fascinating stuff. And, and it wouldn't be 
uh, it would be actually very common that on a, any given Sunday, if there was anybody sick in the service, we would call for the anointing oil. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And they would bring out the, the vase, the jar with the oil. And, the, and I was always fascinated because anytime they would bring out the oil and they'd put oil on someone's sick, I'd be like, oh, get ready. Mm-hmm. They were sick. They about to get healed because the oil. Because it was real serious. You know, sometimes they just pray. But then it was real serious. We'd bring out the oil. I was like, why don't we just start with the oil? <laughs> and there's this one time I was hiding in the, in the prep room. It was, like was kind of like a, a preparation room for communion and different things. And I was hiding in the cupboard. And, and, I, and I found the jar. I found the anointing oil jar. I thought, oh, my school is in trouble. Imagine what I could do with this. I picture myself walking around like Jesus, just healing people. And what do you need? You're a bit short. You need to be taller in the name of Jesus. You know what? What you feel? You need pocket money for lunch? Here you go. And then I, I, I pictured myself re- really ministering with the oil. But as I was looking at the oil, the, the fancy jar, I found next to it a, a bottle of olive oil. I opened the anointing oil. I took the cap off the olive oil. I tested. It's the same oil. My 11-year-old mind couldn't understand how is the anointing oil the same as the name brand grocery store olive oil. I thought we got the the anointing oil from from Israel itself. I, I thought that we'd lay some, some cloth out in the olive garden of Gethsemane and as the dew came down, we'd wring it out into, I, I don't know where it came from, maybe angels delivered it each new day like manna and the pastor collected it from the parking lot. I don't know where it came from. I never considered where the oil came from. I just knew it had power. So to see it next to standard olive oil, I was like, why aren't folk at home in their kitchen? Every time they're sick, just anointing themselves. Couldn't understand it. Couldn't figure it out. It was a conflicting moment. I want you to hold that in your mind for a moment because over this series, we've been challenging some ideas. Over the last several weeks, we've essentially been unpacking the power and the purpose and even the person of the Holy Spirit as we dive in and drive to a deeper understanding and knowledge of what it is that we're a part of this mysterious and somewhat supernatural, actually a lot supernatural nature of the kingdom of God, and at the same time increase our effectiveness as those that are called by God. That's been the goal. And for all intents and purposes, this is essentially God's plan regarding the outpouring of His Holy Spirit, that you and I would be empowered, that you and I would not just fulfill His mission in our own strength, but that we would go in His power. This is how good God is. He doesn't just give you a job. He gives you the power to do the job that he gives you. And so the purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that we would walk in the same power that Jesus himself operated in. Another way to to, to put it would be that we would have the power through the help of the Holy Spirit as our advocate to do what God has called us to do. Actually, probably the best way to even phrase it would be the way Jesus said it. He said it simply in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. In this verse, we have something very unique going on. We've got Jesus teaming up with Isaiah to to really reveal to us the connection between the Holy Spirit and this term called anointing. The Holy Spirit and anointing. Jesus uses a prophetic word from Isaiah, an ancient prophet from the Old Testament, and it marks his moment after being in the wilderness, after being baptized and about to begin his ministry. But before he begins his ministry, he wants to lay claim to the prophetic words stated by Isaiah. And he says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. And he goes on to say, today, this scripture, this prophetic word has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let me paraphrase it. Paraphrase it. You're welcome. Jesus was saying, everything you've been waiting for, you're welcome. It is me. I am anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And that's where we see that the Spirit of the Lord is. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is anointing. 
In fact, we've been doing something intentional every week of this series. We've been kind of giving you a biblical background to the, to the subjects and the context of what we've been preaching. And I want to do the same today with your permission. Without your permission, I'm going to do it anyway because I've been doing it every single week and that's my job. I've got the microphone. You do not. You have the notes. Your job is to take notes. My job is to dictate notes. So if you would go on a note-taking journey, I want to give you some scriptures. They're going to unpack the idea of the anointing for your understanding today. Because there is a critical element, not just an important element, a critical element of your Christian faith called the anointing that many believers aren't tapping into today that I want to give you an argument for that will release you into such a powerful momentum under the Holy Spirit that your Christian faith will not be the same. Will not be the same. In fact, the term anointing is a term that is common throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. You'll find it referred to, doesn't differentiate, it is used in different settings. And growing up in church, my Pentecostal church, the anointing was described as the yoke destroying, burden removing, chain breaking power of God. That's how, it was, that's how it was described. If you were to ask anybody, what is the, all the Pentecostal, man, we need a little therapy group. That's what we need. Because they're all nodding their head like, yeah, it was, it was described. What is, what, is, what is the anointing? It is the yoke destroying, burden removing, chain breaking power of God. That is what the anointing of God is. You will not break a chain without it. You will not remove a burden without it. You will not destroy a yoke without it. But with it, you can break every yoke, but break off every burden, break every chain. That's how it was taught. And it's true. Scriptural. It's derived from Isaiah. Isaiah talks about the fact that it is the anointing that breaks the yoke of burden on the oxen. And I believe in the breaking power of the anointing. That the anointing is required to break things. The anointing is required to break through difficult opposition. The anointing is required to break off demonic strongholds. The anointing is required to break out in your school, in your family, in your workplace, in your city, in your generation. It requires the anointing. I believe in the breaking power of anointing. However, what we find in Scripture is the anointing more significantly signifies the hand of God being on someone's life. That's what the anointing Represents It represents the very power of God. The hand of God is on somebody's life. That's what the anointing represents. From Elijah to Elisha, from Aaron to David, we see a moment where each and every one of them were anointed for service. Biblically speaking, there was a, there was a marquee moment in their life where they were set apart, where they were Chosen by God, they were ordained, anointed, or they had a, a priest anoint them or pour oil over them. And that moment marked them and separated them for the service that God had for them. We see it throughout Scripture. Let me give you an example, if we can, because in 1 Samuel, we're going to find the prophet Samuel go to Jesse's house under the instruction of the Lord to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the next king. He didn't have every element of the prophetic word. God, God just said, go to Jesse's house and one of his sons. Because that's what God will do, by the way. Did you know that? God doesn't give you all the details. He gives you a start so that you will step. That's the way God works with the prophetic. He doesn't give you every single detail so you begin to walk out the rest of your life in complete isolation saying, thanks, God. Got this. You're welcome. No, no, because you'll find yourself lost and you'll keep returning back to God. God's plan is that he would give you just enough to get you going. And as you begin, begin moving, he'll give you more as you keep going because he wants to walk with you. So what we see with Jesse, Jesse the prophet of the Lord gets the instruction, go to Jesse's house. And Samuel, sorry, gets the instruction of the Lord, go to Jesse's house. And one of his sons is going to be the next king. You're going to anoint them. And it's fascinating because I don't know if he sent messenger ahead of time or if he did it on arrival, but as he walks into the house, you've got Jesse's sons lined up. And the moment that Samuel sees Eliab, the oldest son, he's like, that's it. Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. He was a big guy. He had broad shoulders. He was handsome. He was rugged. He had fists. He, he looked kingly. And just as he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before me, the Holy Spirit says, no. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Don't, don't fall into the trap at looking at the external because God looks at the heart. 
So he's a little confused, the prophet. says, okay, cool, we've got several other sons. And he begins to go down the line, but none of them, none of them get the yes. None of them get the green light. I don't know how many times he went up and down the line searching for the son that's gonna be the anointed king. But he gets to the point where he's mystified and he says, ah, ah, usually I'm better than this, guys. You know, usually I hear very clearly from the Lord. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Usually it just comes, you know, like it's there. But today, you know, maybe we need, do we wanna sing? We got a worship team we could bring out and just get some music going because I am not feeling it. They don't have a worship team. So he just says, hey, I'm trying stuff here, Jesse. Do you happen to have another son? And Jesse says, oh, yeah, uh, what's his name? Da- David. <laughs> David's out in the field, right? And Samuel's like, well, bring him in. <laughs> and literally, as David walks in, Samuel gets the yes of heaven. And I love this. It says this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. From that day forward. He was called. He was spoken of. But from that day forward, the spirit of the Lord rushed, rushed like a mighty rushing wind, rushed upon him. This was both recognition of God's hand of favor and it was a commissioning of God's purpose for him to be king. There was an anointing moment. This anointing moment was often a ceremonial moment where olive oil was used to anoint their head, signifying the anointing is now on their life. In other words, from that day forward that they, they were marked. They were marked. You see, this is by no means limited to the Old Testament. We, we see this prevalent in the New Testament as well. Because with a fascinating instruction by Jesus to his disciples in the New Testament, we see a clear inclusion of oil in the process of anointing. Are you cool to keep studying for a moment with me? And we see the oil in the process. If you go real quick with me to Mark chapter 6, I'm going to prove it to you. Because in Mark chapter 6, we see this. This moment where Jesus commissions his disciples to go out and do the miracles that Jesus was previously doing on his own. He had them on this, on this routine and this journey where you watch me and, and see how I do, now, now you go and do. And it was pretty cool like lesson time for the disciples because they were spectating the miracles and the way God was ministering, the way Jesus would move in power. And now Jesus was saying, now you go and do it. And so he sends out the disciples and truly to their surprise, they, they saw the miracles through their own hands. They began to see demons cast out. They began to see people healed. They literally began to see the miraculous work that Jesus had previously done in and through their own hands. And I wanna show you this in Mark uh, chapter six, verse uh, 13. It says, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. They, they went out with oil. They were casting out demons, but they added an element of oil when it came to healing people. And when they anointed them with oil, people were healed. Well, let me show you another verse, uh, James, James chapter 5, turn there real quick, or write that in your notes, James chapter 5, verse 14, it says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, bringing the oil for the healing. Now, let me make sure you understand this and I speak this clearly as I can. The oil is not the anointing. The oil is not the anointing. The oil represents the anointing. The the oil is an element that represents the invisible element, which is the anointing of God. But the oil is a tangible representation of the invisible element of the anointing. In the same way that we take communion and the communion has the bread and the cup, which represents the body and the blood. The bread is not his body. The the cup is not his blood, but it represents his body and it represents his blood. So that when we partake of it, we are partaking in the body and the sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ. In the very same way, the element of oil 
represents the anointing and leaves a mark. So that when you apply the oil to the forehead of the recipient of who is being anointed, it is a visual reminder of what's invisible in their life. It is a visual reminder because the oil leaves a residue. It leaves a residue, a physical reminder that you are marked by God, that you are set apart and, and, and marked. Marked as in identified, identified, identified. In fact, going back to the Old Testament, once you were anointed, you were no longer identified how you were previously. So that anointing moment, stay with me, that anointing moment changed things. It shifted the way you were identified because you were not now identified with who you were, but now what you're marked for. Well, lean in real quick because I need you to get this. We see it with David. David was anointed by Samuel. He was marked for, for to be king. And then we see this. We see the situation where, where, where he, he's no longer being referred to a shepherd boy. Previously, he was the shepherd boy. Now he's marked to be king. And there's this, there's this situation where they're trying to call for David and they don't know how to refer to him. And check it out. I'll show you what's in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18. It says, One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. How many descriptors do you need of one person? But he's fumbling. How do we, how do we articulate this guy? We used to just call him shepherd boy, but now he's anointed. We can't refer to him as just a shepherd boy. He's, he's got all these descriptors. He's skillful in playing. He's a man of valor. He's a man of war. He's prudent in his speech. He's a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. That David. Oh, that David. I didn't know which David you were talking about. Now, now I, now, now I want you to take note of this overly detailed description of David because it's important to pay attention to because in Jewish custom, in the biblical era, people didn't have surnames. People didn't have, it wasn't custom to have surnames. People only had first names, which is cool if your name's Nebuchadnezzar or Mephibosheth. Not many folk running around with that name. But if your name was John or Judas or Mary, a lot of folk with that name. And so how do you know which John, Judas or Mary we're talking about? In a situation, especially if it was a crime, you know what I mean? That's bad news, you know. Hey, John, hey, what me? Why, yo, yo, there's the other John. Which John? Uh, that John. So they didn't have surnames. So what they did in that day is they had different identifiers, different ways to identify. For instance, the most favorable way to identify somebody was whose son they were. That's why we see James, son of Zebedee. You, you would identify by their son, the lineage. Now, if you couldn't find or identify you by your father for some reason, the next best thing would be to connect you with a location or a tribe that you are from. That's why we see it's Jesus from Nazareth or Aaron the Levite. This was a common practice to connect you with the hometown, the place of birth, the place of origin or the tribe that you were associated with. Now, let me go a little bit further. If the father wasn't known or reputable and they couldn't really locate your place of origin, the next best identifier would have been your trade, like Simon the Tanner. Now, if you weren't prolific in your trade and you didn't really know where your origin story was and you weren't really sure of who your father was or nor was he reputable within society, the worst case scenario is that you would be identified by a physical feature or ailment. That's where we get blind Bartimaeus. Now that's how you were known, by a, by a condition, by a set of circumstances, by what had happened to you, that you were known forever, not just at the glory of your name that was given to you, but your condition would often precede it. He is blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. However, the best identifier of any individual 
It was actually being marked by anointing. See, this means you weren't identified by what you'd done or where you've been or who you're from, but you were identified by what's to come. The moment you were anointed, you were identified by what's to come. David was anointed to be king. He was still a shepherd, but he was no longer called the shepherd boy. He was David to be king. He was identified by what was ahead, what was come. Stay with me. Maybe you've noticed this throughout Scripture where, where, where you've got uh, the Pharisees. They, they refused to call Jesus anything but the Nazarene or at best rabbi because they were reinforcing that you can't be identified by your father because that's a mystery to most people. Instead, we're going to just pin you down a notch and say where you're from, the, 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 Nazar, the Nazarene. But you see, when... You get anointed, you get a new identity. Get a new identity as one anointed. This is why it was so dramatic when Jesus would heal people. He wasn't just healing them of their condition. He was changing their identity. Because everyone would have known blind Bartimaeus by the fact that he was blind. But the moment he's not blind anymore, he needs a new name. What is he seeing, Bartimaeus? Come on, he needs a new name. How many people know what I'm talking about? Not blind Bartimaeus. That would be a good one. Was blind Bartimaeus. I'd go with that. Was blind, but Jesus Bartimaeus. Can I take that one? We see this with the anointing. The anointing shifts an identity. Identity. This is what the Pharisees did. They, they only called him the Nazarene because they refused to acknowledge him as the Christ. In fact, there's a very significant moment in Scripture, if you would pencil it in your notes, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where, or verse 13, where you've got Jesus having a conversation with the disciples, and he asks them a pretty plain question. He says, who do people say that I am? Now, do not get it twisted. He ain't concerned about his PR reputation. He is not concerned about PR. He wants to know how are people identifying him. And in the conversation, we have a fascinating uh, uh, back and forth. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 16, let's go to 13. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ. Now, do not miss the significance of this moment. Christ is not Jesus' surname. I know you knew that, but sometimes you forget. Jesus is his first name. Christ is not his surname. It's a descriptor. Christ means the anointed one and the anointing. It means the anointed. Why are you not writing this down? I don't know what's wrong with you today. It's like it's a birthday service. You're just here to, you're here to learn. Come on. It's the anointed one and the anointing. This is what Christ means. It means something. It has meaning to it. And therefore, the Pharisees did not want to give Christ that label of the anointing because they did not want to recognize that he was from God. Because if he was from God, if he was the anointed one and the anointing, they couldn't call him the Nazarene. They would have had to call him Jesus, son of God. They would have had to call him Jesus, son of God. And here we have Christ. This powerful revelation from Peter was actually First revealed way back in Luke chapter 4 by Jesus as his marker. As he opened the scroll, remember in the synagogue, to the, to the prophet Isaiah. And he went down and there's no verse numbers, there's no chapter numbers. He had to go through the scroll. You had to find, there it is, there it is. And he goes to the point, the specific point where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Now I have to inform you that that is not just the case for Jesus. This is great birthday news. This is my birthday gift to you, church. This was not just for Jesus. Because if you will allow me, I want to show you that this is how the anointing works in our life also. And I want to show you through Scripture. I don't want to just give you my thoughts, my opinions. I want to show you the pure, unadulterated Word of the living God. I want to show you in 2 Corinthians chapter the t one, write that down. The first chapter of Second Corinthians, probably one of my favorite passages. You're going to see why in just a moment. But in Second Corinthians chapter one, it says this in verse twenty: For all 
the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has, check this out, anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. It is Christ who has anointed us with him. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee. It's not only Christ that has been anointed, but in Christ. You have been anointed also. Ooh, this is good. This is good. This is good. This is good. Lesson over. We're going to preach now. You have also been anointed. And remember what the anointing is. The anointing is a a marker. The anointing is an identifier. Before Christ, you were anointed for the things you did. With Christ, you're, you're identified by what he's called you to do. Stay with me. Stay with me. I want to show you another passage. If there are some from more of a Reformed theology background, you're struggling with this. I want to help you with another scripture in 1 John. 1 John. I say that because the Reformers love 1 John. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 18. It says, children. It's the last hour. Now you've got to understand what, what John's writing to. He, he's, trying to, he's trying to help the confused believers identify who, who, who is the real Christians. <laughs> Who's here just for the meal? Because back in the early church, church would provide meals and provide all these things and they were confused like who's here for them and what they can get or who's here to build the kingdom. And, and John brings a delineation. He says, children, it's the last hour and as you have heard that that Antichrist, uh uh-oh, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you, real quickly, point your neighbor, point your neighbor. But you, have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. But you have been anointed. Now, now, now let's back up to the Antichrist for a moment because coming from the Pentecostal background, the Antichrist was pretty much the boogeyman in our world. The boogeyman who's like any, any scary story, it had the Antichrist in it. You know what I mean? It's what mom would, you know, you'd pack your lunch and be like, watch out for the Antichrist today. You know, that's how it pretty much worked. Don't watch Ninja Turtles, it's the Antichrist. Literally. And so we had this this looming figure was was the Antichrist. But but what John does is he's like, no, no, more than just this looming figure in the future, if we know what Christ means, which is the anointed one and the anointing, we know what Antichrist means. It pretty much means anti-anointing. It's those without anointing. Those that aren't anointed. Those that... Haven't been. See, see, the Holy Spirit was poured out without measure, but that does not mean everyone received the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit comes upon those who are in Christ Jesus. And those who are in Christ Jesus who receive the Holy Spirit are anointed from God. Those who are not anointed are anti-anointed or anti-Christ. It's a differentiator, it's an identifier, it's a marker. It's a marker of those that are anointed so that you and I would know that what makes us different from the world is that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, and I'm marked for more. I'm not just marked like an elitist, separate. No, I'm marked for more. You see, what you've got to understand, when Jesus read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, He didn't stop halfway. He didn't just say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me. That's where a lot of believers want to end that passage. So you can sit in your armchair at home feeling anointed. Just feeling, oh man, God bless me. God bless me. God bless me with a parking space. God bless me with favor in my job. God bless me with a promotion. That would be a self-centered anointing. That your anointing is all about you. That your anointing is all about your shield of protection. That your anointing is all about you. But Jesus didn't stop at that. 
Jesus continued and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. He has anointed me. Come on, church. He has anointed me to. There is a to. There is a purpose. There is a for. There is a reason. There is an objective. There is an assignment. There is a mission on the other side of the anointing. I'm not just anointed. Yes. I'm not just anointed. I'm anointed too. I'm anointed too. I'm not just set, set apart from. I'm set apart for. So now my past is no longer my identifier. I'm no longer Adam the sinner. I'm, uh, I'm Adam the saved, sanctified, redeemed, set forth, put on a purpose, anointed, holy from God, ordained by Him, called by Him, commissioned by Him, sent out with a mission and power from God. It's what I'm anointed for. What I'm anointed for. What I'm marked for. I'm marked for more.